Hi, so as Will said, um, I'm CEO of Endreams. We've been working on VR for about two and a half years now. So we took a, what at the time was quite a brave decision to dive in and pivot completely to focus on VR nearly two and a half years ago. Um, the reason we did that was that we, we fell in love with VR. Um, I'd first experienced VR back in the 1990s in a place called the Trocadero in London. They had some, I think they were virtuality headsets, and you stuck one of these enormous great big things on your head. And um, the demo I remember very vividly, you actually you were a baby, and it took you down, Jed was talking about scale earlier, it took you down to being a baby crawling on this floor, and you were trying to avoid the feet of the adults walking around above you. And it was very low res, and it looked awful, and there's no textures, and it was very jerky when you turned your head, the latency wasn't great. But even then, there was something very special about the idea of VR. There was something really, really special about being in that world and being able to look around. And I remember that moment very vividly. And then two and a half years ago, we got a, an early look at the DK1, and Sony very kindly showed us an early prototype of the PlayStation Morpheus, and we kind of flipped. Um, I didn't dive onto a table like Jed out of the way of a train, but we did have some guys in the office who watch a lot of horror films, who are very big, hefty guys, very tough, not scared of anything, play Silent Hill you know, in the dark and uh, not scared. And we, we tried them on a very early VR demo, uh, really basic, very flat walls, um, but there was this thing, uh, there was, it was scary, there was this thing hunting them. And um, I remember the, seeing them play this demo and they screamed like a baby, they were so scared. And what was really apparent right from the beginning, even without photorealistic graphics, was that VR was acting as an emotion amplifier. It made everything much more powerful. Fear is the easy thing to get, but actually um, we've found you know, more recently things like ex you know, surprise and awe and all these other great feelings that you get in good games are much more powerful than VR. Uh, and that's really the reason we decided to focus on VR. There's something very magical about it, and I think it's going to be very big indeed. So um, we started working on some early games. We did a little demo called Skydiving, which basically had you leap out of, uh, off an island in the air about two miles up and fall to your death um, whilst dodging things. And it's a little free demo we stuck out there. And we got a great reaction to it, and that kind of convinced us this was something that's going to work. We've actually launched a couple of um, uh, games on Gear VR. Uh, Gunner and Perfect Beach, and Perfect Beach has just come out on um, the Google Play Store as well, so we're doing some stuff with Google Cardboard. And they were both very quick, short sort of uh, games and experiences, in fact. Gunner's a, a shooter, Perfect Beach is about relaxing and chilling, and you've had a stressful day and being on a beautiful beach. Um, but they're, we're learning a lot, and they're both mobile VR titles. Um, the other half of our team, we're about 40 people at the moment, um, are working on uh, high-end VR, so VR for PlayStation VR, for Oculus, and for HTC Vive primarily. Um, and the first game that we've announced is called The Assembly. Now, rather than show you the trailer, which we created for E3 and is probably everyone's seen once or may have seen earlier, I've got some footage which I, we recorded last week, just some in-game level footage, but it gives you an idea of uh, what the game's about and the sort of quality levels that we're, we're looking for. So the idea is it's a three to, well, four hour long adventure um, with two characters. You play as a girl and a guy, you switch between them as you go through the chapters. And it's all about exploration and searching and, and pulling open drawers and looking around and following a really powerful roller coaster story. So one thing we realized when we saw the guys in the office and friends and family trying VR for the first time was that people just want to look around. You know, the first thing people do is they try to reach out and touch things and they, they look under tables and they look at the cobwebs in the corner and spend ages looking at little details. And uh, VR really is about exploration. That's what makes VR so special, I think. So we've got um, we've, we, the assembly builds on that and we think adventure games are going to be a great uh, genre in VR and this will be out as a launch title for the, uh, the Oculus, uh, the Vive and PlayStation VR uh, next year. So what I'm going to talk about is one of the biggest challenges, I think, in VR, which is traveling without moving. Um, move, movement is really, really important in VR. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work on it over the last few years. Our very latest focus test, um, I'm going to give you some, some actual data from that. This was the sort of most recent little test we did. Um, we had um, doo -doo -doo, 22 experienced gamers. Um, doing about 30 minutes each. We chose gamers because we believe the audience for the high-end VR for the first 18 months is going to be gamers, they're going to be experienced gamers. This isn't going to be a mass market casual audience initially because the VR headsets are going to be relatively expensive. Um, but these guys are mostly inexperienced in VR. In fact, 15 of them had had less than two hours in VR, seven of them had never even tried a headset before. So this was a very inexperienced, this wasn't the development team who got used to VR um, because that's something that does happen. If you guys have got studios, um, you get very comfortable into VR. Your brain is brilliant at learning, and you'll find that after using VR for day in, day in, day out, you get super comfortable, and you don't get, um, you know, you, you're not a good judge of what people will be like for the first time. 
But we'd also previously done lots of other testing. We've done lots of internal testing actually over the last couple of years. We've done events, both uh, getting press to play the game at things like GDC and E3. Uh, but also we did our first public demo up at uh, EGX um, this year. We had, I think, about 1,500 people or something come through and play the game over a period of three days. And that was fantastic. We had big queues around the block and the feedback was fantastic. And it was really nice to actually show it to people who may actually buy the game for the first time. And also we've got some testing from Oculus. So Oculus are fantastic. If you guys are working on uh, Oculus, uh, any Oculus games, send the build to them, get them to give you some feedback. And they had an internal team, played through the, the build, gave us some fantastic feedback, and that was very, very useful. Um, so one thing that we kind of knew immediately was that uh, even before this, was that around 50%, 40 to 50% of people suffer discomfort when walking around in VR. And this is with using a tr kind of traditional controls. You stick a normal first-person control system in there, and at least half of, well, up, almost up to half of the people feel pretty, pretty uh, a significant amount of discomfort. Um, that does vary depending on the frame rate. If, you, if you're not running at a proper uh, suitable frame rate, that can be much worse. But also things like room temperature. If you're at a show and people have been running around and it's hot and sweaty and claustrophobic, it gets noticeably more of an issue than it, than it, it does if you've got a nice cool room, which I think is one of the reasons that Oculus have air conditioning. If you ever see them at the shows, they have lovely air conditioned rooms. Um, Another way of looking at that is that 50 to 60% don't suffer discomfort when walk, walking around in VR, which isn't bad. There are some people that find traditional controls quite comfortable and it's no problem at all. But we, uh, we really need to make walking comfortable for everybody. People want to walk around. People have got this vision that has been presented over the last 20 years from great movies of VR. It's this amazing world where you can walk around and feel like you're actually there and explore. People want free movement, and it's a big challenge, but it's one that I think needs to be solved. I believe we will come up with a standard, not we end dreams, but we as an industry will come up with a standard for VR movements over the next year or two. And I think that'll be something that's accepted by people and becomes the way that you move in VR. And so we're kind of, we want to tell you a little bit about what we've learned, what we're doing with the assembly. And uh, we're also listening to other developers and, and I don't know who will, together we will emerge on, on a standard that works really well, I think. So the most obvious solution is let's just make it easy. We'll stick the player in a wheelchair or we'll have you in a cockpit or we'll have you stationary and have the action work around you. And that's perfect. That works really nicely. It's a comfortable solution. But I don't think it is the, the solution that uh, it, it's not, you know, people want to walk around. And as I said, these are, these are kind of band-aids, I think. They're kind of plasters. That, that's, they're quick fixes. They do work. But you don't want every game to be set in a wheelchair. You don't want every game to be static. You want to move around. It's something we need to solve. Um, also, even being pushed around isn't a complete solution. So one of the early versions of um, the assembly, uh, we, we did some tests, and we have a, the very first level you get pushed around in a gurney, so you kind of get pushed into this mysterious underground bunker. And it's a little bit like uh, if you played Half-Life, you know, the train intro. It's a lovely way to start the game, and for us, it means that people don't have to worry about movement. They can just look around and listen and kind of get taken down into this mysterious place. Um, but even with this, um, we found that there were some issues. Uh, we had um, people, uh, if, you, if you suddenly move upwards or you get pulled backwards and you're not expecting it, or if you stop suddenly, or if you turn when you're not expecting it, there was still a little bit of discomfort. So we're ironing those out. But even with a, you know, you're in a wheelchair or you're on a gurney or you're, you're on a rails, there are still issues. So that, even that's not the perfect solution. So how do we find a solution that's comfortable for 100% of people? That's, I guess, the, the, the real goal. So we, what we've done is we've got two different control systems in the assembly. We have a traditional control system for people who are relatively comfortable moving around, but we've worked very hard to make that as, as responsible and as ideal for VR as possible. And then we have an alternative control system, which is designed to be comfortable for everybody. The alternative control system um, is going to be our default. So that's the controls that you have when you come in. But we will explain to players the two of them. And if they're comfortable and they want to try the traditional controls, they can try it. And they can use that if they want to. So we're basically offering two different control systems. Uh, and I'll explain what, we, what, what both of those are and why we've chosen those. But we think it gives as many players as possible a really comfortable way of moving around 3D worlds. So let's talk about traditional controls. Um, so the basics, any VR developer kind of needs to know this stuff. Um, people are comfortable moving around in VR at realistic speeds. Most traditional console games, Call of Duty be a good example, has you running around at up to seven meters per second, which isn't far off what a sane bolt would be running when he goes down the 100 meters. 
In VR, because you believe you're there, because you've got a sense of presence, it makes sense to match the movement speed to what you're used to. And most people don't, most people don't jog a lot. They actually, you know, they, they walk quickly or they walk. So one and a half meters per second seemed to be, from our early tests, a really ideal speed for moving around VR environments. Now that suits an adventure game because you can take your time and you can wander around and look at things. You're not being chased by things. Um, so it suits our game. I'm not saying it's perfect for every game, but we, we certainly noticed that that worked well. Another basic is don't touch the camera. As soon as you take control of the camera at all, as soon as your game moves the camera and the player who has the camera effect we attach to their head uh, doesn't expect that, it's horrible. So don't ever touch the camera. And also acceleration can be a real issue. Actually moving very fast isn't the problem. Um, moving at speed but, uh, uh, but not accelerating or decelerating isn't too bad at all. It's the acceleration that really kills you. So try and avoid acceleration unless it's incredibly fast. So that's kind of the basics we knew. But some of the findings we had from this most recent test, where we kind of we, we focus on just a handful of the very best systems that we thought are shown there. I don't know if you can read those, but um, I'll try and highlight some of the key things. So we have over there um, moving around at sort of 1.5 meters per second and moving at 2.5 or 2.4 meters per second. There was a lot more people were comfortable, a lot less discomfort moving. Um, and this is all with traditional controls again, okay? Um, moving slower than moving faster. So that it, was, it was significantly better moving at a slower speed. Strafing. I don't know many people who ever walk around like a crab like that. Um, but it's not natural. So again, having a really slow strafing speed, one meter per second or slower, was much more comfortable. And as soon as you have a safe strafing speed close to what you're used to in a traditional game, oh my God, the discomfort, you know, there's way more discomfort than comfort. That's horrible. So you really, really don't want strafing to be fast. You want nice, gentle, slow strafing because it's a very abnormal movement. And then for rotating, what was interesting was that we tried a, a, a sort of normal slow rotation, which is 30, 37 and a half degrees a second. So it's kind of like, that sort of speed, which you might expect to have in an, in an FPS. And then we tried, because we'd, we'd, we'd got some experience before, a really fast rotation speed of about 250 degrees per second. Now, I would have expected prior to this that the slower rotation would be much better. It's much more comfortable, it's slow, you know, it's, that's great, it's fast, it's crazy. But actually what happens is because you want to turn from here to there, you flick the, you flick the control and you move and you, you, you flick it back before you've even noticed you're moving. And the speed is so quick, it's less than the time it takes your body to, or your head to feel sick. So by having a very, very fast rotation, you're, you've moved and you're, you've stopped before you've even noticed you're moving. And so it actually, ironically, uh, becomes more comfortable. So as I said, rotation, actually 18 of 22 people preferred a high rotation speed, which is cool, which is quite interesting. Um, strafing, you've got to have strafe of less than one meter per second. Um, and the most common cause of discomfort with these traditional controls was when people did a mix of it, when people were turning their heads and strafing and moving and rotating at the same time. What we found, incident, uh, interestingly, was that people um, instinctively stopped doing it. Actually, that wasn't, we didn't want to stop people. If we had some control in the code saying, if you're turning your head, you can't move, and if you're moving, you can't strafe, it was too limiting for people. People very quickly realized, oh, when I do all that together, yeah, I won't do that, I won't do that again, that's fine. And then actually, that the way they played from then on was just using one controller. They'd walk forwards, they'd stop, they'd have a good look around, they'd turn, they'd strafe to get into position, and, and actually, it, it, was, it worked pretty well. So that's the traditional controls. If you want to allow as many people as possible to feel comfortable using kind of traditional twin stick style controls, the best way to do that is, is here, is like this. It's to have a natural movement speed, a high speed of rotation, if you want to use the right stick for rotation, which I'll suggest some alternatives in a minute because it's not always the best example. But if you want to do that and you want to offer a traditional system, make it fast, um, consider adding an alternate rotation option and don't have any perceived acceleration. They're all things that we think work well for having a traditional sort of system. But it's not a solution for everyone. Even if you do that, you might get 60% of gamers feeling comfortable, but you've still got 40% of gamers who are not happy, you don't feel comfortable in that. So what are we gonna do about that? How are we gonna make a solution? And that's our alternative control system. This is gonna be the default for the game, um, which is what you, you have when you start. So, the things that cause issues are movement, actually physically moving forwards a little bit, moving strafing much more, and rotation, particularly when you rotate and you also rotate on your head separately. That's truly horrible. If you ever do the, turn the stick right and turn your head left, that's horrible. So the best way to get is to get rid of them. If you can get rid of those, you can get 100% of comfort across all people, which is fantastic as far as we can tell. 
So how on earth do you move around a space without doing movement or rotation? That sounds like I'm talking complete rubbish, doesn't it? Um, hopefully you'll agree I'm not. So the very best rotation system is actually to move your body around. So if you can actually rotate by turning your body, that's 100% comfortable, that works super well. And on the Vive, that's an absolutely perfect solution because you've got tracking coming all the way around you. It doesn't matter which way you're pointing. You wanna do rotation if you can, by turning your body on the Vive, it's brilliant. It's more of an issue on the, Morph on the PlayStation VR or the Oculus because Oculus Touch requires you to face forward. If you turn around, you obscure the, the, the touch devices and it can't track them. The same is likely to be true with PlayStation Move. PlayStation and Oculus are much more of a sort of face forward VR system. Although you can look around behind you, your body's not gonna be turning. You tend to be, you're most likely to be in a sofa or in a, in a seat um, using, using those devices. So, Although rotating your body is the perfect way to do it, and uh, you know, if you've got a, a nice uh, seat that rotates or some of the, the great peripherals I've seen out there, that's ideal. We can't rely on that. So there are different types, two different types of rotation we tried, which we thought re re worked really well. One is trigger rotation. So in this, you press the left trigger and your character snaps um, 45 degrees. You press the left trigger again, your character snaps 45 degrees again. You press the right trigger, your character snaps 45 degrees. So basically the way you're playing it is by using the triggers to snap and then you can look around and search and pull things out and interact and do stuff and then flick, flick, I'm over there and then you, could, uh, and then you can uh, do whatever you want in that area. So you're basically switching between sort of 45 degree arcs. And actually that's very intuitive, it's really comfortable and people uh, they find it much, much better. The other solution, which actually Palmer Lucky suggested, um, was called snap rotations. The idea here is if you move the right stick to the west, your character will immediately turn west. Uh, if you turn your stick down to the sort of southeast, your character will immediately turn southeast. So basically your character turns to whichever way you position the stick and let go. So it means you can instantly move your character anywhere. This is actually, and again, if you, you place, uh, push the stick right down, you'll do a 180 uh, like that. So it's a very powerful system. Once you get used to it, it works really well. But our, some of the guys doing the tests found that it wasn't very intuitive. It wasn't what you expected. It took you a while to get used to it. But actually, it's a really nice way of rotating once you've done it for a little while. The very best movement system, as I said, is kind of, is actually uh, in terms of move. So yes, yeah, so we're going to move on to movement now. The very best movement system, a bit like with rotating, is actually to move. And if you can't move, if you don't have a huge space to move in, and on the Vive, you, you, know, you have a little area, depending on what people's rooms are like. And that's one of the challenges with the Vive, incidentally, is that not everybody's going to have a three meter by three meter space. Some people might not have any space yet and be using it as a face forward VR headset until they get some room. Some people might have two meters by two meters. Some people might have different areas. So it's going to be very hard to design games with that in mind. With the assembly, it's a kilometre long. This, this is a huge underground bunker with lots of rooms and spaces, so we can't physically model that. Um, uh, sadly, that would be great. So the best way is to actually have a, a trackpad or something like that so you can move on the spot. They're fantastic, but I don't think they're very commercial. Um, you know, they're going to be exp <coughs> fairly expensive. I think they're going to be fairly niche. I think they'll be great for arcades and out-of-home entertainment, but um, I'm not sure my wife would be terribly happy if I got a huge, great one of these uh, things in front of the TV, and uh, I think it's going to be hard for people. So uh, the reality, sadly, are that you know, it's, it's, not quite as, uh, it's not quite as easy as that. So how do you move? Well, there are two systems that we like the most, um, and these are, you know, lots of people are trying these out. One is straightforward, it's a teleport. So you press a button, you get a little reticle, you use your head to decide where you want to move to, the, the sort of reticle sticks to the ground so you can decide where you want to go to. You press the button, and then you teleport there instantly. Um, and then you can look around and do stuff. And that actually works brilliantly well. It does break the sense of immersion a little bit. It does, it's not natural, but when you get used to it, you still feel presence and you can still move around completely comfortably. So here's an example in the assembly. You get a reticule up, which sort of attaches the ground, so you can move your head. You can actually change where you rotate when you finish on this, this little prototype version as well, so you can decide where you're gonna point, and then you press the button and you teleport there instantly. And again, that is super comfortable for absolutely everybody. The version that I prefer uh, is called Blink. So the idea is very similar. You get a reticule, you aim it at the ground, you decide where you want to move to, you press the button, you let go of the button, and your character moves there, but very fast. So within 100 milliseconds. Now this 100 milliseconds time is really important because that's less than the time it takes your head to feel ill. So you get a feeling of having whizzed through the scenery, you feel like you've actually moved there rather than teleported, so it feels more natural, you get a better sense of presence. But because it's 100 milliseconds or less, you don't feel sick at all because it's been too quick for you to feel any kind of, any kind of simulation sickness. So here's an example. So you position the reticule, 
decide where you want to move to, press the button, and then you whiz there nice and fast. And again, that's really comfortable. Now, what we're doing is actually limiting how far you can teleport to. We don't want people going right across the other end of the level or the thing or the space. So we'll have a maybe 10 meter, 15 meter radius that you can move within it. But actually, this is a really comfortable way of moving for everybody. So let's take a look at some of the results. Actually, and actually, in this latest group, we got a real 50-50 split between those two types of movement. Um, half of the people liked the teleport, I think because you could actually alter your rotation and it was, they felt it was a bit more precise, but you could obviously change the angle that you're gonna point at the end of the movement on the blink as well. Uh, the feeling from the blink one was it was more immersive. And I think that's the solution that we're likely to be, uh, to be going with. Um, we also have uh, tried the rotation out. The trigger was definitely preferable. It's much more immediate and accessible. The only positive comments about the snap was that the, it offered more flexibility. Uh, but I think we'll, we're more likely to be going with the trigger system for our alternative control system. But we're going to be doing some more usability testing between now and when we launch. So a very quick summary for the alternative system. Try and remove movement and rotation altogether, add alternatives. So we're going to be going with the teleport or the blink or the trigger and the, the snap look. Most likely the blink and the trigger, I think, are the options that work the best. Um, but they were super comfortable and everybody was happy and everybody, everybody found that they worked for them. Um, now, I haven't mentioned touch controls. I've talked about controllers. The reason for that is that we're making launch games and um, the Oculus isn't going to launch with Oculus Touch. We don't know if the PlayStation VR is going to launch with Move Controllers. We have to assume that some players won't have Move Controllers. We'll just have the DualShock 4. Um, and even with the HTC Vive, um, we want to make sure that people have controller support if they're using controllers. It seems a sensible thing for a launch title across multiple platforms. Having said that, all of the stuff I've talked about will work with touch controls. The Oculus Touch has two sticks. It has triggers. It has buttons. So you can do all of that stuff I've talked about with the Oculus Touch. The Vive controllers have dual sort of circular D-pads, which can work in exactly the same way with triggers and with buttons. The PlayStation Move that sold came with a left stick and triggers. Um, the, you don't have a right stick on the PlayStation Move, so if you wanted to support the similar system, you wouldn't do right stick rotation, although you may not want to do that anyway, but you can certainly do all the movement stuff. You can do trigger stuff for, for snapping. You can do pretty much everything using these controllers as well as traditional controllers. So that's the route that we're going down. There are, if you want to do touch only, motion control only, there are some other options. You could potentially reach out and drag the world around you and rotate it that way, a bit like you're sort of dragging on a pad. We haven't tried that. My instinct is it's not going to be super comfortable. You're still going to get issues with the rotation, the fact that you can rotate your head in a different way. But we'll see. We'll have a play with that. But at the moment, we want a solution that's going to work on, on controllers as well as motion controls. Finally, interestingly, these were gamers, remember. Actually, 17 of them preferred the traditional controls, even though about five of those found them a bit discom uh, found discomfort. They wanted to work through it. They found, OK, this isn't great, but you know what? It's, it's, it's my preferred way, and I'm going to get through it. So I know I can get used to this. And in fact, a lot of people in the office have done that. You know, they preferred, the tradi they preferred tradi uh, traditional controls, and they kind of worked through the discomfort. And I don't think that's, we should expect anyone to do that, but that's why we're keeping traditional controls in. We think it is an even better way of moving that keeps a sense of presence perfect. So if you can get those tailored to VR as well as you can and offer them there, then people can have a play. And if they're comfortable, if they want to try them out, they can do. So working on your projects, well, you know, experiment with first-person movement if it's appropriate for your title. Um, you know, there are lots of great VR games that aren't first-person, but I'm obviously talking about first-person movement here today. Um, implement comfortable alternative controls as a default that try and avoid natural move movement and rotation if you can. There are lots of options, but they work really well and they're super comfortable for everybody, so anybody can play your game. And um, I would suggest that you include optional traditional controls that are tailored to be as comfortable as possible for VR, which means just thinking about the speed of turn and the speed of strafing and moving and all that kind of stuff. And test everything. What works for your game may be different. Our game's an adventure game. You know, if you were doing a game where you were sprinting or you were being chased or you were dashing around shooting people, again, your needs are going to be quite different to this. I'm just giving you sort of feedback of what works for us and what we've found. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you. Top stuff. Thanks so much, Patrick, and many brilliant physical demonstrations through your own <laughs> movement as well, which is great. Um, so yeah, considering um, End Room's experience in this kind of thing, I'm expecting loads of hands to shoot up. I hope you're not going to embarrass me now. <laughs> Any questions? Fantastic. Uh, chap with the leather jacket there was just about quickest, so um, far away. Okay. Hello. Um, 
With regards mostly to the rotation, but I suppose it applies to the moment as well, did you find any people getting disorientated by the quick snaps or changes? Um, no, although we did try, I mean, I've gone into, I've tried to summarise this, we did a lot of other tests where we had larger speed rotations. So, you know, if you do a snap that's 90 degrees, you, you're almost jumping too far and you, it's quite easy to get disorientated if you press the trigger a couple of times, you're like, oh God, where the hell am I? It also depends on your environment. If you've got an environment where it's very obvious where things are, that's not too bad. If you had a, a smaller environment, a simpler environment where actually everything was mirrored and it didn't look too, it would be very easy, I think, to get disorientated. So if you've got a nice detailed environment it, with 45 degrees, it's not too bad, but we, we definitely did experience it if the angle was bigger. Yes, one bit. Any more? Um, that, oh, I was going to say Dan, the guy with the microphone's not going to know that. The Dan with the glasses on. Thank you. You, you mentioned that um, the teleportation and blink methods of movement were a little less immersive. And yeah. I'm wondering whether or not you know what that's down to. Because I noticed in that you've got um, a UI reticle that's showing you where you're going to move. Obviously, that's not something that you would experience in normal movement. Yeah. Is that perhaps why it's less immersive? I don't know. I think, I think it's... <laughs> I think it's a good point. I don't think it's a UI inter uh, interface, although it's something we could explore. Certainly, we could have a robot doing the UI or something that felt like it could actually be in the world. I think it's more that you expect what you see to match what you're used to in real life. And because in, you know, if, if in real life we actually teleported regularly, I think it would feel fantastic and it wouldn't break the presence. But none of us, I don't think any of us, are used to teleporting a lot. <laughs> so um, I think that's the issue. I think it's the fact that you've moved some instantly, and that's a bit weird, and that, that's not what you're used to. I think that's why the blink method, where you're actually moving, even though you're moving very quickly, is better because at least you feel like you've, you've, you've moved through environment. Um, you know, I'm not saying they're the perfect system because you do lose a little bit of that presence because you're moving. But I think once you get used to it, it's fine. And because it's so comfortable, because everybody's comfortable, nobody feels motion sickness, it's so worth doing, even if you're losing a little bit of the presence. I'd rather have, you know, if you've got a presence bar of 100%, I'd rather have everybody comfortable playing at 60 rather than try and hit sort of 80 or 100 and have lots of people feeling, feeling ill. It's really important that everybody likes VR. Great. Um, the, the hands everywhere. Yeah, the chap with the glasses was already, his was flying up early, so I think he gets the mic next. Hiya. Uh, it was just in specific to the blink methodology that you're using. Do you lock the person's head rotation just for that short blink as well? Um, we are likely to, but because it's 100 milliseconds, it's so quick that um, I don't think in any of our tests anybody has tried to turn their head whilst they're doing it because it's so fast. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to say lock the head movement because I think any time you take control over the head movement, it's bad. You should always allow the player to move. And that's a, you know, another conversation. If you've got a wall and you're there and you want to move your head into the wall, what do you do? If you stop the player's head moving and you lock it and you're moving your head and it's not responding, that feels horrible. So you, almost, you do want the player to be able to keep moving, even if he goes into the wall. And there are other solutions for that, fading to black and doing other things. So I'm not sure I'd ever want to lock head movement. But the good thing is because it's so quick, it's 100 milliseconds, actually you're, you're you're barely going to start moving before you're there. So it's not actually been an issue. Right, it's a good question. There are a few more. Um, yeah, there's a guy a couple of rows back with a leather jacket. I think it's a leather jacket. From... Oh. Hello. Um, so I know it's very difficult for VR developers to test VR um, because we don't usually get sick now. Uh, but you have been mentioning many thresholds like the 100 millisecond or the rotation at 260 degrees per second. Will you consider or have you considered allowing the user to calibrate those values because or, or because in most games, yeah. normal games, you can adjust the sensitivity of your mouse, but I haven't seen yet a VR game that I'd let you adjust that as well. It's certainly something we've talked about. Um, and we're aware, actually, if you look back at when consoles came about and everyone was used to aiming in first person with a mouse. And the I don't know if you, any of you guys, I had this experience when I first used a controller to try and aim a first person shooter. And it was horrible. I was looking up at the sky and the ground and it was, it was nasty. I was like, oh, this is horrible. You need a mouse. This is a really bad way of doing it. But it, and the very first games that came out had tons of variables. You could adjust the sensitivity. You could adjust the dead zone. You could adjust how fast you moved. And the problem is, I think, for developers, that's fine, but for your average guy who plays FIFA and Call of Duty and doesn't understand movement and game design, it's quite tricky, you know, asking him to set the dead zones and the values, oh, I don't, that doesn't feel comfortable with me. So I would rather we set them to the very best values. And if we find that actually there's a group of people who like this and a group of people like that, we might just have a couple of options and allow people to switch between them. But I'm not a big fan of allowing people to switch around with kind of game design variables. And maybe if you're doing a, a, you know, a, a hardcore gamers game, a PC strategy game where you're more comfortable 
all that, that's great. But we're trying to aim for you know, as many people as possible. And I'm a bit nervous about giving lots of value to people to tinker with. Oh, I think we should squeeze in one more. Oh, um, guy with the shirt was just beat you to it, I'm afraid, sir. <laughs> uh, just a quick one on the ordinary directional treadmills. Uh, I, I get they're not going to be mass market, but do you see that as a really good um, method? Is it, is it very successful? Yeah, it's great. I mean, the ones I've tried two or three so far, um, the walking movement isn't completely natural. I'd love to find a treadmill where you just walk normally. Um, it's, it's slightly odd, but you know, they work brilliantly well. The great thing is you, you feel like you're moving, so you're completely comfortable, you turn, you, and it just works. It's, it's the best solution. If somebody could find a way of building something which was really lightweight and cheap, I could stick on and just walk and I stay on the spot, uh, it'd be brilliant. So I really hope that gets solved, but we, we, you know, there are so many great VR peripherals out there, but we as a developer have to decide what to support. We could spend months and months and months supporting every single headset, every single different piece of hardware and tracker and things, but we're trying to figure out what's going to be commercial, what's going to sell a million units or more. Um, and I hope the Virtuix Omni does really well, but it is expensive and big, and the other ones are, you know, will they sell? I don't know yet, but it's a great solution.